Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Mike Cook. If you'd like to take a seat, come and join the MindTech Second National Symposium. A great warm welcome to you all. Can I just have a show of hands? Who, who actually was able to come last year? And who are the newbies then? You've... Now, you are particularly welcome. The... <laughs> we've got, we've got, we've got uh, fresh new people who are going to join in this network, I hope. It's uh, a really great pleasure for Chris and myself both to welcome you. Chris Hollis will introduce in a second. Um, welcome to the Royal College of uh, Physicians. There are a little bit of housekeeping I've got to do for you, so bear with me. Fire alarms, no test for today. We've just got a strike on, but apart from that, in the NHS. Um, toilets, uh, lower ground floor, first aid, please contact college reception, Wi-Fi access, and get through uh, the Royal College. Um, please Twitter. We like to see uh, this go wide. Uh, hashtag MindTech. Uh, and we'll do some, a few questions at the end of each session. There's, there's four sessions, in effect, today with some good keynote speakers. Um, and if you do want to ask a question, we'll be managing you, so you just ask the question and say who you are and, and where you're from. Um, uh, but no speeches, please. Um, we'll just try and uh, keep to time, because it's a, it's a very full program, an exciting one, but a, a busy one. We've had a, a change to the program. We're going to uh, push through to lunch by uh, 12.20 uh, and still give you a, a, a nice hour or so to network and see each other. We'll also break for coffee after this first session. Um, and on session four, we're asking you to submit some questions. Uh, Sarah's going to chair a, a really good panel of people to try and get some interaction with you going. Uh, we'd like to see the post-event feedback, please and uh, you'll be given a certificate of attendance after, afterwards uh, from Angela and, and the team. And on your mobile phones, please just switch them to silent. You're not that important today, honestly. This is more important. Um, so that's the housekeeping. Um, I'm really pleased to be chairing uh, MindTech. It's a real privilege. And uh, I'm going to just keep the uh, morning uh, running. We're going to look at current research on um, e-mental health and remote video technology for mental health care interventions. Um, and we've got some interesting speakers for you. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce Professor Chris Hollis, who's the clinical director of MindTech uh, and uh, the inspiration behind MindTech, who's going to put this all in context. Welcome, Chris, and I hope you have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mike, and, and uh, thank you to everyone for, for coming to, uh, today. It was the, uh, we had a sl slight discussion about the second national symposium, and people said, well, it does feel a bit like the difficult second album, you know, so how's it, how's it going to kick off? Well, it's, by the look of that poll, I think it's, it's fantastic, because I'm, I'm really excited about the potential, but also what's happening in the mental health technology uh, space. And I'll just share a few thoughts with you about that, but it really is about a community coming together, the mental health technology uh, community, which you're uh, part of uh, today. And, and I think what's, what's really quite unique is the, is the kind of mix that we draw on and you'll hear from today, service users, clinicians, <coughs> academics, developers uh, from industry, and also policymakers. And it's that combination coming together which is really uh, ex exciting. Uh, I'll just share a few thoughts with you about what is actually happening at the moment and why this is such a, an important and exciting time. We, we have this uh, real challenge. It's almost, we talk about it being a sort of perfect storm of, of, unmet, of unmet needs, the, the treatment gaps in, in mental health care, this, this funding shortfall, and how we're going to respond to that. And, and we're getting real directions and some real movement at the moment about how digital technologies in health and in digital health are there to transform service delivery, not just to add on and do more of the same, but actually do things very, very differently. And of course, in wider society, we've got this transformation in terms of the digitalization data, uh, a growing uh, digital health market, um, 
the quantified self, Internet of Things. So this is, this is not something we can stop or, or ignore. We have to uh, find ways to integrate this and use this uh, power. We were part of uh, Sally Davis, and I'm delighted Sally's endorsed our meeting, meeting today. And I think what Sally's done is a great advocate uh, for mental health and putting really on the agenda those, these really in huge unmet needs. I mean, the challenges that we've got in terms of access and the challenges we've got in terms of getting uh, evidence-based treatments uh, to people with mental health problems and, pre and, and preventing uh, those problems emerge and exacerbate. So we're very clear about there's a real purpose and there's a real need uh, to address, and the NHS is really taking that forward. I think the, so the five-year forward view is a very important document because it talks about digital health as a way of transforming uh, services and, and doing things in new ways. And, put, and the, the uh, National uh, Information Board document, again, is very, very important uh, in terms of setting an agenda, a framework uh, for, 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 for digital health. And you'll be familiar with Tim Kelsey, who chairs the, the board, has talked about this issue of trust, about evidence, and we are, our focus today about how, how if we're going to convince the NHS and clinicians to take on board these digital tools, do they know that they are safe, that they're effective, um, and how can they recommend them in their, in their practice? So this is really important. And the issue of accreditation, kite marking, I think will come up again today and we'll have discussions about uh, how this could actually happen. So I'm really optimistic and excited about the future. And I think you share, share that about the potential. And our last uh, first symposium really set out the agenda of that potential. And we've described some of that in the, uh, in the CMO report uh, chapter. But there are some real challenges. And today we're coming together to address those challenges, to get down to some of those key issues. Uh, we have paradoxes. We have a lot of innovation, but we have slow adoption, very patchy adoption into the in, particularly into the NHS of technology. We also have this challenge that technology is changing at a pace, uh, the pace of processing, the, 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 the power of, uh, and, and the innovation in, in, in apps and different digital technologies faster than our ability to evaluate. And so we have to think about what our tools are and our methods. Are they appropriate? Do they need to change? And that will be the focus, I think, and the challenge for today, and it'll go on beyond today, but that's our real uh, challenge because we're pioneering often in areas where um, existing forms of evaluation are not effective. So we have this uh, gap really. So we, we've, we know that in, in society digital use is, is, is huge and growing, but actually in reality only one, perhaps two percent of transactions in the NHS uh, are, are digital health transactions. So it's not uh, the take up, the adoption at the moment is really dramatically uh, different from other areas of, of uh, say, banking, retail, etc. And we need to understand that and why that's, why that's the case. And this is the great report um, from um, the uh, Mental Health uh, uh, Net Network and, and Rebecca Cotton's group, looking at what mental health trusts are doing with digital technology. And you can see the, the bottom there, the mobile and online applications in terms of mental health trusts, none of them at the moment were actually doing that but their aspiration was high. So there's a huge gap in terms of aspiration and, and, and delivery. So in terms of the task today and the, and the agenda that we're setting ourselves, we're looking at frameworks for evaluation and evidence. How do we evaluate a very diverse range of products and how do we uh, have different frameworks for taking these forwards so, so that industry actually knows what's required of them? We've got legacies from pharmaceutical trials and evaluations, which RCTs, which tend to be long and expensive, medical device evaluation, primarily risk-based, not efficacy-based. So there's a need to think really about new ways of evaluating digital pro products and tools and getting data uh, into the system much, much earlier. So I think we, today we'll have some discussion about these different types of methods, when RCTs are needed, when they're not, how we can approach data, and essentially how we can generate uh, data faster because that will be necessary if the NHS is actually going to take these products forward and get them into uh, everyday practice. Thanks. Thanks for the stimulus today. Uh, so mind the gap, but beginning to close it today between us, uh, we've got two 
really interesting presentations now. Uh, the first is uh, from Professor Sean Lewis. Welcome from Manchester. He's the director of the Institute of Brain, Behaviour and Mental Health at the University of Manchester, was one of the co-authors of the uh, chapter that Chris mentioned, uh, uh, that Dame Sally uh, endorsed strongly in her Chief Medical Officer report. Of course, he's done much more than that. And he's going to talk to us a bit about uh, how digital mental health approaches to managing psychosis and early intervention uh, to improve outcomes has actually influenced practice um, uh, that, that he's run. So welcome, a big warm welcome to Professor Sean Lewis. Welcome. I'll talk, talk very briefly about um, some of the issues that I think will be discussed later, the, the things that uh, Chris particularly touched upon, about how you evaluate these things. We're talking about these new technologies, mobile, online technologies. Should they be evaluated in the same way as medical devices or even drug treatments, that is for safety, effectiveness, efficacy, uh, acceptability, those sorts of things. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about something we're doing in Manchester, linked to something called the Manchester M Health. Uh, connected health ecosystem, which has been going since 2010 and links into MindTech. So we work together. And this is about trying to help people suffering from serious mental illness. And just a quick reminder for us, there's an issue about people with serious mental uh, illness. Uh, they form the focus of secondary mental health care services in the UK. Yet there's a risk that because of all these new online and uh, mobile health-based uh, support and intervention uh, uh, innovations are aimed at people with uh, more minor, more common health disorders, that people with serious mental illness get uh, uh, ghettoized in a, in a new digital divide. So we're talking about, about one in a hundred people. And most of us who work in mental health services would admit that our services are not best fit for purpose at the moment, little prevention focus, and whatever else, people in contact, service users of these services, report that their experience of care is poor. And if you like to think of their three types of intervention, if you like, in terms of clinical interventions, drug treatment, psychological treatments, and service level interventions, it's not difficult to think through how connected health support and innovation can help each of, those, uh, each of those areas. So in terms of SMI, there, there are two particular systems, I guess, which have got a little bit of publicity. There's Sarah Aman, is um, Sarah here somewhere? Yeah, there we are, Sarah. Sarah. So she, uh, in, um, uh, with the help of uh, colleagues and service users, has, has developed a system for support for people particularly with early psychosis, uh, and Sarah is now working in Oxford, and we in Manchester have developed something called ClinTouch, which has been, uh, uh, which is basically an open source platform for support of people generally with serious mental illness. So we've been lucky enough to have the development work funded by three MRC grants. And I first wrote the first grant for this in 2008. So it's, it takes ages, as you were saying, Chris, to get this stuff funded and then go through all the traditional academic, clinical academic rigmarole of doing feasibility studies, randomised controlled trials to assess safety and uh, efficacy. So just briefly, it's based on the mobile phone technology platform. It's an SMS version, but we focus on the smartphone version. Um, and um, uh, a key issue here, which I'll come back to briefly in a couple of minutes, is experience-based design. So getting service users themselves, as I'm sure Sarah, uh, Sarah would agree, service users themselves to really drive the functionality and the visual appearance and uh, all sorts of things to do with the, with the interface. So how ClinTouch works, your, your uh, smartphone or your mobile phone uh, gives a semi-random beep two or four times a day, and then you've got 70, well, you've got a minute or two, typically it takes 70 seconds, to fill out a personalised set of core items to do with problems and symptoms. That's then wirelessly uploaded in real time to a central server where it's rapidly built into a, to a database which uh, gives an idea to the user themselves of how their symptoms fluctuate depending on what they're doing uh, and external stresses and things like that. 
then you so it sort of goes like this if you like beep respond a bit of feedback you can then share the service users can then choose to share the the summary data which is uh, on a graph on, the, on their handset with their mental health professional friends and family and what we've now done is build it into uh, an end-to-end -end system building into services in in the local trust mental health trust uh, with the aim of involving health professionals with two particular focuses uh, on uh, getting, uh, um, as well as getting uh, service users to help manage their own symptoms, also to get health professionals involved in uh, uh, looking out for early warning signs of relapse, early warning signs of suicidal ideation. Uh, and so what that looks like is you get a a, a, a desktop in the mental health team base and uh, if a threshold, a personalised threshold which is set up in the context of the care planning meeting at baseline is exceeded, there's a set of clinical algorithms that the, the clinical team use to contact the person or not. So going back to when we started, people thought all this was just preposterous. They thought it was science fiction. We had a couple of focus groups of, of uh, health professionals about four years ago, and they came up with all these objections to, they said, you know, all, they, all, you can read all these, they said, well, people with serious mental illness don't even own phones, they certainly won't be interested, they'll either lose or sell a handset if you give them one on loan, which we often do, it'll get them paranoid, it'll be too complicated, it'll take far too long to do, they'll stop using it, they'll make up the responses anyway, and if you do get responses, they won't resemble the sort of data that we collect systematically at face-to-face -face clinical interview. So we use this as a framework to uh, address these issues. And within a year, we'd found that most of these were fictitious, although a couple of them in the first 40 or so people that we put through this for uh, two to four weeks uh, uh, did, um, uh, there were issues. So, uh, well, one, one dropped the handset down the lavatory uh, and um, the, the, to, uh, the issue about it making people paralysed. This is a safety issue, and I guess we'll come back to this later in the day, but uh, obviously new technologies such as medical devices and certainly new drug treatments were evaluated first for safety uh, and then for efficacy. Should we be doing that for, for these sort of innovations? It's quite... Oops be quite nice to think they're all very benign and safe, but can we assume that? So it turns out in this case we can't really because um, about 5% of people who, with serious mental illness who started using the system got paranoid. They thought their phone was, was um, uh, bugging their brain and things like that. So we know that this isn't safe. It's quite safe, and we now have ways of predicting with whom it is not safe, but it's certainly not completely safe. Um, so just some words like experience-based design. So we've got a standard operating procedure for involving service users uh, in, uh, uh, in liaison with a visual design company and with uh, technical developers for driving the sort of development of this stuff. And just a few sort of quotes from our early group. So people already bringing up issues about how they might feel conspicuous in public using such a system. Uh, and, uh, but a variety of issues which we found quite useful in de deciding what to, what to, uh, what to pursue. Uh, and similarly, we had a, a so, so you know, take one instance, the initial clunky visual design was soon sort of transferred into a bunch of cats and dogs and things like that, which people could personalise and find attractive and, and put, 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 put in their own, own uh, uh, prompts. Um, and similarly, our staff focus groups brought up a, a load of uh, issues <coughs> which changed over time as, as health professionals start, started to realise that this was probably not the, the uh, 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 preposterous idea that, that they thought it was at the start. So our four, four hoped for outcomes here are an improved service user experience of care, improved health self-management, so using these, these algorithms that we'd be, we're building into uh, the system, so we, we can now uh, start to try and predict what makes people better and worse and arm people with that, that information so that they can modify their behaviour if they want to accordingly. This early warning signal stuff, building it into, uh, uh, into uh, uh, 
community mental health teams. And obviously, in the longer term, there's, there's an issue about the, the, the value of, of these very rich data sets, which you can imagine build up relatively quickly if you're getting responses uh, two, three, four times a day from individuals with uh, serious mental health problems. So to finish off, these are some of the issues, I guess, that we've sort of grappled with. Many of them are predictable. So as Chris mentioned, technically these things are medical devices uh, and a whole bunch of regulatory issues comes along with that. Um, so what we've tried to do is address issues of feasibility and acceptability, both to service users and at least as critically as it turns out, if you're going to build these things into uh, current mental health services, professionals themselves. Safety, I've touched on, privacy, security, data analytics, validity and reliability. So we were careful to, uh, to do experiments correlating the data that's coming out of these um, uh, 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 self-rated devices with standardized sort of rating scale interviews, and they stack up pretty well. Uh, operational integration is a huge issue. So it took us six months to build this into uh, our local mental health trust, uh, and that is you know, get, getting all the data streaming through into e-healthcare records and things like that. Uh, it's not a, a and because each NHS, NHS trust, of course, has a different ICT setup, so you basically are more or less starting from scratch with each trust you try to build it into. Um, and my last slide, so what have I learned in all this? So it's been going for uh, uh, five or six years now. So I suppose looking back, uh, the first issue here I wasn't convinced about. But I have learned that that is the single most important issue in getting this stuff to work, that getting service users genuinely inputting at every level of the development process is... Is, um, is, is critical. And we've got to the stage now where we have workshops between geeks, technical developers, who've never met anyone with, with a mental health problem before, let alone serious mental illness. So we have groups where service users and technical developers just sit down and talk through this stuff together without, without people like me even being there. Um, uh, and second point there, as Chris quite rightly said, well, you know, the academic framework, which is what I work in, basically, it's what I'm paid to do, um, it's not fit for purpose in this context. It's so costly, it's so long-winded, uh, and what are the, what are, for instance, what are the substitute de experimental designs, uh, real-life designs that, that could, uh, uh, could do away with the huge issues about randomized controlled trials. So we have done, I think, eight randomized controlled trials now in this process, some of them quite small, uh, but it, it's a big issue for each randomized controlled trial. You've got to set up all the R&D governance issues, the ethics um, uh, issues, things like that. So safety, I think it's important to demonstrate safety with all M and E health interventions. I don't think it can be assumed automatically. Unfortunately, again, that means another sort of governance type framework that you've got to deal with. But I think we owe it to people, particularly with serious mental illness, to make sure that what we're doing is safe. And for instance, if you go on the NHS um, app store, none of the things on there have any safety evidence, uh, which is a shame, in my view. Uh, clinical governance issues. So the whole issue about the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Agency, if you've basically got a uh, uh, an app which is trying to do something in terms of, of a diagnostic or an interventional thing, it's got to go through MHRA. That's at least how things stand at the moment. So our initial stuff didn't need to go through MHRA. Our most recent stuff, which is delivering uh, simple psychological treatments, is going through MHRA registration. That's a big deal, both in terms of uh, uh, monetary expense and logistics. Then you've got another thing not to underestimate. The... the Resistance of, of health professionals, to some extent, unintentionally, understandably. They're busy people. They do want more stuff to learn to do. But really, the whole system is not built to incorporate this stuff. And another mistake I think that people understandably make is thinking, right, well, an app, that's pretty simple. Just stick it into the service. Let's see what, what it does. 
what you're doing here is redesigning the whole service, basically. And you, I don't think you can underestimate uh, uh, how disruptive that potentially can be. Um, and as I was mentioning, all these NHS trusts, and I think at the bottom there, so we've tried to introduce this into two trusts. It's worked in one. It hasn't worked in the other. The other trust outsourced its ICT systems to a third party. They just couldn't get the stuff done in time. They had plenty of other stuff they, they were well behind on. So it is an issue, and certainly you probably should cost in four, if not six, engineer uh, months' time minimum if you're going to try and seriously build this stuff into, into an NHS trust. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. Um, the, the next three speakers are Professor Richard Morris, who is ready to fire already. He is uh, uh, our Professor of Psychiatry in Nottingham, University of Nottingham and Nottinghamshire Healthcare. And uh, Dr Sam Mallins is clinical psychologist who's going to support the presentation on um, faster translation of, of, of evidence into practice. Uh, looking at video conferencing for health anxiety. There, they're going to hand seamlessly on to then Dr. Mike Scan. Welcome from Northampton, uh, who's a nurse consultant who's been using video technology to deliver IAP services. So, over to you guys. Seamlessly, we move forward. So, thank you very much for asking us to speak. So, here is an example of something that we're trying to do through uh, the clock. One possible way of moving things faster through a system is for uh, centres to be funded who can move more swiftly and quickly than conventional funding systems through NIHR. Um, so, I'm going to talk about this study that's funded through the Clark East Midlands. Um, and I'm also going to... Uh, then pass on the actual treatment part to our, to our clinical psychologist who's working on the study, uh, Sam Mellins. So here is the research team. I really wanted to highlight the, the, the rich variety of people that are involved. So they include some service users, some, some people who are working within the services in emergency care and in primary care in the NHS across the East Midlands, people who are working in the research team, um, a number of, of different therapists, We've drawn on expertise from a previous Clark study on uh, very frequent attenders in primary care. We've, built, we've also drawn on Mike's experience of doing practical experience of using video technology. We also built on a previous study that's been published in the Lancet of a trial of, of, of cognitive behaviour therapy for um, health anxiety with Helen Tyra. So we've drawn on those uh, areas of expertise. We haven't done eight randomised controlled trials beforehand. <coughs> um, so health anxiety and medically unexplained symptoms cost the NHS an awful lot of money. Who knows, really? An estimated £3 billion per year in unnecessary costs. That's an estimate done not by ourselves, but by the what was previously known as the Sainsbury Centre for Mental Health. For, for health. And, the current government priority is to reduce unnecessary use of emergency care. How is it going to do that? Six RCTs show the effectiveness of face-to-face -face CBT for health anxiety for up to two years with a reduction in urgent care use. Um, but the RCTs have been done in secondary care outpatients with screening which, on a mass level, which actually costs a fortune in itself. Uh, or it's been done in volunteers, not done in primary care or in A&E, where perhaps the, the, the need it really is. Um, and well, furthermore, uh, when patients with health anxiety who, do you who utilise a lot of health care have been identified, um, the successful reduction in costs have been in emergency care use, not routine medical care use. Um, so, but patients with health anxiety can be reluctant to receive face-to-face -face therapy. In particular, they have not liked face-to-face -face IAPT care in our previous Clark study. And we talked with them to ask them what they would accept. And other than being seen in their primary care, the other option was either telephone or video conferencing. So remote delivery of psychological treatment uh, have in, has in other studies been shown to be as effective as face-to-face -face therapy, but there are no trials of this in this form using video conferencing um, for health anxiety. So the two aims are can cognitive behaviour therapy and evidence-based talking therapy offered to people over the phone or the internet. We have that option to use the phone in case the internet doesn't work. 
help it relieve symptoms causing distress, improve physical and emotional health, and reduce the costs of emergency or urgent care appointments. And what is the best way to, to deliver this? And uh, engage service users and staff and deliver this treatment, put it into practice. We use this, this is, this is absolutely essential if this is going to be actually implemented into practice. So these are our eligibility criteria, age 18 and over, two or more consultations, referrals or hospital admissions with a provider of unscheduled or emergency care in the last 12 months. Admissions and presentations are not attributable to an identified pathology. They could include the follow those, those types of symptoms. Exclusion criteria, pathological medical condition requiring further assessment or acute management. However, almost all these patients will have a pathological medical condition. Um, at the same time. It's just that that is stable and doesn't explain this presentation. Other severe mental illness or organic mental disorders are excluded. And this is the trial design. So the size of the, of the trial is 144 people. Um, and it's a randomized controlled trial and they'll be put into two treatment arms. And then those are the outcomes. Health anxiety is the primary outcome. We, because this is a very pragmatic study, the rest of the outcomes reflect what IAPT would would measure in terms of outcomes, in terms of other symptoms such as depression and anxiety. In addition, we're doing a full economic analysis. Um, and we're also exploring views of patients and NHS staff, what helps, what makes this talking therapy difficult or uh, more um, pleasant to, to deliver. Um, I'm gonna pass over to Sam Mellons. I'm Sam uh, and I'm the, the therapist on the, the, the trial that Richard's just described. Um, and uh, I suppose I'm going to give you a view of uh, an NHS clinician kind of naive to this kind of software prior to starting this study and my kind of experiences of designing uh, an intervention using it. So um, I'm broadly going to just be looking at, uh, over a few minutes, the kind of potential for additional benefits that I've seen from, from, from doing it so far, uh, but also the potential for frustrating costs. And I suppose what I mean by that is, um, so if you, if you take the example of, of like a telephone cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, there's pretty good evidence that you'll get a similar level of effectiveness as one-to-one -one face to face um, therapy. Uh, you'll probably lose a few more people, but it's probably gonna be similar. And I can see that there, from, from what we've done so far, that there's a potential for that, that kind of option to be around for this kind of video conferencing therapy, but with additional stuff on top, maybe you could get, uh, tease a bit more, um, help a few more people in, in a greater way. From this, but at the same time, there are things that I think could really pull the rug from under uh, this kind of this kind of intervention. So, uh, before I get into that, I just wanted to explain the system that we're using. So, we're using uh, Cisco Webex, um, which some of you may already know. But just to, to explain what it is, um, we we chose it on the basis of three main criteria. Firstly, uh, that it was secure enough to be acceptable to, to the local NHS services. Uh, secondly, that it didn't require very much on the kind of patient end of, of, the, of the software. And thirdly, because there was a really good level of functionality. It's not just uh, like the video, you, you can have this kind of video screen of, of you and, and the other person and however many other people you might want there, um, but that can be full screen. But also you can share documents and uh, you and the other person can modify, adapt, uh, look through that kind of stuff. So it's great for going through worksheets or workbooks, that kind of thing. You can share your, um, your desktop and, and, and it's really helpful in, in that sense. And I suppose um, I'm already going into the potential benefits here, uh, uh, but what's really great about that is that at the end of the session, you can record the session. So you get a, a video recording of the session and any resources that you used in that session, the final version gets emailed to all participants uh, from that session. And I suppose for me, the integration of all those things together is, uh, has the potential just to nudge the things forward in, in people who, who, uh, who might not do intercession tasks, for example. Um, and so, for example, we know that um, listening back or, or re-listening to your, your session between the, the, that session and the next one, uh, it, it consolidates learning and it also promotes doing kind of homework tasks. And if you're getting all of those things in, in one email, it, it gives me the sense that maybe it'll make you feel like you're owning that a bit more and you might be more inclined to, to get involved. And uh, second time we've seen this slide already, count it as we go through the day, but um, it really makes the point of how this fits with, uh, within the broader 
opportunity uh, and potential for digital health in that we've got more reliable internet connections, the kind of proliferation of smartphone use. And I suppose I've been thinking about the people where I couldn't be in the same place as them, but they were free and we could have had a session. This kind of answers that, that solution. Wherever they are, wherever I am, we could, we could have the session. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity, particularly in terms of engagement, to help people get into, into therapy who wouldn't choose to do one-to-one, -one, who wouldn't choose to do it in another modality. However, um, the, the key problem um, when, we've been, when we've been looking at this, so we've, we've kind of tested this out with um, service user consultants, um, other clinicians, the research uh, study team, and whether people kind of go, actually, yeah, I can really see that that would have benefit, or people would kind of think, mm, not so sure, has been nothing to do with any of the functionality of the software or anything we've presented. It's almost exclusively been down to the quality of the internet connection. Um, which is not obviously not a factor if you're doing telephone therapy or if you're doing one-to-one -one therapy. And I think it's just got the potential to undermine people's trust in, in that as a, as a helping, um, helping kind of system. So um, we've, we've worked really hard on contingency planning and how we would work around that. And I suppose my conclusion to all of this is, uh, what's the verdict on video therapy? Is let's find out. And I, I guess this is probably a theme for the whole day. Um, in that, as an NHS clinician, you would never have the time to do the amount of planning, testing, contingency planning that we've had to do just to get to this point in, on this study. And, uh, and also, you'd have to be kind of pretty gung-ho when there isn't, uh, to, uh, to have confidence that it was going to work when there isn't the evidence base there. And I suppose, it, for me, when I think about the two hats, kind of NHS clinician and researcher, you want to know about what doesn't work or what goes badly just as much as uh, you want to know about what does work. So it's really helpful if in a research setting we can kind of tease out what's, what's going to go wrong so that when it goes anywhere else, um, that's already been thought of. Uh, but now I'm going to hand over to Mike, who is, is much more experienced in, in doing this kind of therapy. I think that, that sort of bit about being a bit sort of gung-ho and going for it anyway um, might have been where I was, I think. Um, and the, it really, um, there by a sense within our, our IAP service of um, just, just having to find a way to reach the people that we can't normally reach. So we, we started off, as you'll see there, with people with long-term conditions and medically unexplained symptoms. And we started off by um, really looking at these, these people that can't access IAPT services or really struggle to access IAP services. And so we started off, ours was much more of a group program. So we used teleconference therapy to begin with to run groups. And this was part of the Pathfinder site, which was evaluated by Surrey University. And as part of that, we've been able to um, identify the sort of core therapy competencies um, and experience and training. And, and I would say the most important part of this is the sell at the start, is that if you don't sell it to your patients, when you phone people up and say, would you like to be part of our service, which means that you'll get the, 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 the first um, step is the teleconference groups. And then we do one-to-one -one video conference therapy. And it's all supported by the mass webinars, which I'll talk about a bit later. You really have to sell that, and you have to, as Sam was saying, you have to meet people's objections, and you have to talk it through. And motivational interviewing, I would say, was the sort of um, communication style that you use at that, at that stage. Um, we have been able to illustrate improvements in economic factors and healthcare utilization across primary and secondary care. But I would say we, we're using the wrong, um, the wrong data sets within IAPT very often. And so some of the, the, the outcomes we get are a bit harnessed by the fact that we're, um, we, we're stuck to a very tight data set. Um, we've also identified the clinical effectiveness and improvement in condition and status um, using the PHQ-9, patient health question 9, and um, the, the GAD-7 predominantly. Um, so as I said before, they have a weekly group telehealth therapy with brief one-to-one -one support. And, um, and then they go on to have the, um, those people that are stepped up come and do video conferencing with a, a, a more experienced um, high-intensity therapist. And what we found is that using this, oh, well, I'll let you read, the recovery rate is very, very good in people that go through step three and then uh, through step two and then step three. Where it gets particularly um, impressive, the, um, the best recovery rate 
is where people do the um, webinars uh, uh, along the top. The our CCG are uh, um, most interested, I would guess, in the fact that um, GP surgery visits are reduced for this for, for, the, for this patient group, and the primary nurse uh, primary care nurse contact is is reduced. And what we found was that once people come into the group therapy and then the one to one. Um, they, they, they almost don't seem to need that level of visiting, that level of support from your primary care clinician. Um, and we, we used the health thermometer, which showed um, significant improvements in the areas that they identified as being the most problematic when they started, um, when they started and by the end of the, the, the um, input. Um, who benefited? We've, the people that have taken part in, 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 in this process, as you can see, is very, very wide. We've got some of our best results with people with persistent pain, um, ME, and chronic fatigue syndrome, which was interesting. Um, and that's because we place a really high emphasis on emotional regulation at the start. So the first two sessions of the group program are, 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 are very highly based on actually creating the calm to be able to think differently. And we would really, um, we would really say that that's been, that's been of, of crucial importance. Um, these quotes here come from the mindfulness webinar that we've, we, we've been using. So we use mindfulness-based stress reduction webinar. So we, can ha we have had um, over 300 people all doing an eight-week webinar, mindfulness-based stress reduction webinar at the same time. So with just me running it, um, we, we, in, in the evening as well, because it's just one evening of my time once a week, that one, which means that we have 300 people that go right the way through and we finish with, um, I think it was 170. So you do lose people, but you would, I, I think, anyway. And um, the beauty of it is, is that, um, as Sam was saying, is that if people aren't able to uh, um, listen in live, what, we, what they do is they get sent the recording. So um, of the people that dropped out, the, all we were able to measure is people that were still um, tuning in, as it were, to the weekly webinar. But we don't know how many of those people carried on accessing it in their own time afterwards. And that would be another um, research question. And for me, I think that um, our first speaker spoke, Sean, spoke about the importance of acceptability. And um, these aren't doctored at all. Uh, when we finish, we just ask people to contact us and let us know what they thought of the process. And um, well, if you just have a little read of that, because I think that's some of the most powerful stuff that we've, we've come across is, is it, it was really very, very life-changing for some people. Um, and um, uh, they found the whole, the, the whole business of being able to do the mindfulness from their own home. You know, anxious people not having to get a bus or not having to drive. And when I've done mindfulness-based stress reduction courses in the past, I've always done them in pokey church halls. <laughs> you know, and they're cold, and the floor is hard, and it's not very nice. Um, you do it from your own home. I think that makes quite a difference. Um, so we need to expand the approach. So we're currently um, running webinar groups in that moment for mindfulness for pain. So we've linked up with the General Hospital for our, our clients for that one. Um, it's import I'm important too as a group for dementia caregivers that we've just started. So, so what we found is particularly important is that um, people who are carers of people with dementia won't leave the house to attend therapy because very often their, 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 their fear is that they, they can't really leave their loved one for very long. So um, by providing the webinar-enabled um, therapy course, I'm important too, which is aimed at the depression and anxiety that people who care experience. We've done that one. A very popular one is sleep therapy. So we can do the whole sleep therapy course via webinar um, alongside. My belief is that at some point, I'd love to work with our colleagues here to look at whether you do the one-to-one -one therapy, which is supplemented by a large group intervention, um, which, which covers something rather <laughs> Um, um, sort of um, at a macro level, which is, I would guess most people with health anxiety, the research would say, also have problems with sleep. So if you were running maybe a sleep program over the top of this that people could access as part of their health anxiety, hitting sort of 300 people at a time, it's cost effective and, and reliable. Um, in terms of the evaluation, as I've said, patient acceptability is very, very important. Um, the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7, I don't think are uh, are as fit for purpose for a lot of the, the groups that we're running. But the PHQ-9 in terms of safety is very important because what we do is if somebody scores significantly on the PHQ-9, they're always followed up on the suicide question. 
So um, we, 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 we kind of make sure, and because everybody gets that, um, tele the brief, and it is brief, telephone call in between, we are able to work that way. Um, I'm much more interested at the moment we're using the perceived stress scale with our um, mindfulness courses because I think that will give us a much better um, impression of, 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 of how people feel they're doing as, as a response to this. Um, Self-efficacy measures is where we're moving to. And of course, um, we're, we're continuing with the economic uh, evaluation, which was really hard to do, but um, we, we used um, the, the um, CRI, I think it was, to, to try, and, try and do that, and we want to continue that in the future. So um, I guess I found that I would say the number one point with this stuff here is, is selling. That if you, if, you, if, you try, if you don't sell how effective this can be, if you don't spend time with people answering their queries and their concerns, because with the webinars particularly, people are terrified that other people will see their, will see their email address when it comes up. And what, we, what I try and do is I mute everybody, because you can imagine if you have 300 people doing it and they're not muted, um, you could have chaos. So you mute everybody. And then before, if somebody clicks in saying they'd, they'd like to make a comment, you ask their permission first and make sure that they're okay, they understand that everyone's going to hear it. So there is a sort of protocol and a, and a learning to go through if you are using this sort of uh, approach. I think that's me. Um, thank you.